The sermon you are about to hear was recorded at Grace Baptist Church, Cape Coral, Florida. For additional sermons and more information, visit our website at truegraceofgod.org. God does not have any grandchildren. He only has children. The only way that you will ever relate rightly to God is for him to do a direct work in your life, bringing him to you, bringing you into a personal, direct relationship with him. The only way that you will ever be a part of God's family is for him to adopt you personally and bring you into that family. The only way for you to become a child of God is for you to take God on His terms to receive His provision of salvation that He has made by giving up His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who came into the world to live the life that He requires of us to die the death that each one of us deserve to die, to bow before that man, Jesus Christ, as Lord. In the first chapter of John's Gospel, which we just recently finished studying over several months here on Sunday mornings, the Apostle John tells us that Jesus was in the world and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, John wrote, and his own people did not receive him, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children who were born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. If you want the right to become a child of God, then you must be born of God. You cannot earn it. You cannot do anything to attain it. You cannot receive it simply because you have parents who are God's children. God's grace does not flow through your efforts or through bloodlines or your family relationships. All of us have had earthly grandfathers. None of us has an earthly or a heavenly grandfather because God only has children. Those who come to know God as Father come to know Him that way through faith in His Son, Jesus Christ, as Lord. Now, brothers and sisters, that is a lesson that all of us need to remember, work hard not to forget, lest we fall into the temptation of thinking that simply because our children are growing up or have grown up in homes where their parents have known the Lord, that they necessarily automatically themselves will come to know the Lord as well. There are many, many blessings that go with being raised in a Christian home, growing up where Jesus Christ is worshipped and honored as the only Savior of sinners. But none of those blessings automatically make children Christian. Every generation must stand on its own before God and determine whether or not it will live for God in wholehearted devotion and loyalty to Him or whether or not they will seek their own way not enough to have mothers, fathers who know the Lord. It's not enough to have ancestors who are faithful to the Lord. Each one of us individually must personally deal with God and determine, will I live in humble dependence upon Him and His terms? Or will I seek to make my life work on my own terms either by rejecting God altogether or offering to Him only a half-hearted obedience. The Old Testament book of Judges is a historical record of what happens when people who know better offer only half-hearted devotion to our wholehearted God. It teaches us the dangers 
of second-hand religion. It teaches us the temptations that come with second, third, fourth generation of people who have known God. In the book of Judges, we read of people whose half-hearted spirituality turns them away from God and brings pains and sorrows into their lives for years. But God's wholehearted faithfulness to this people refuses to give up on them and continues to pursue them with unwavering love and grace. Today, we begin a study of this seventh book in the Old Testament. It's the book of Judges. It's found on page 200 if you're using one of the Bibles that's provided for you in the chairs. And I encourage you to get a copy of God's Word in front of you. Open it there because this morning we want to kind of do a flyover and I want to introduce the book of Judges to us as we launch into its study over the next several months. What I intend to do today by way of introduction, is simply point out some of the themes that we find in the book of Judges as it relates to the overarching message of God's sovereignty and grace toward His people. In chapter 1, verse 1, down through chapter 3, verse 6, we have an introduction to this book. It's actually a two-part introduction, one part of which looks back to when Joshua led the people into the land of promise and then the second part of the introduction, giving us a summary of what happened to the people after they inhabited the land of promise. Beginning in verse 7 of chapter 3, all the way down to the end of chapter 16, we have the main body of this book. And in it, we have the account, a historical record, of how God's people in the land of promise conducted themselves, repeatedly falling away from Him, repeatedly needing to be brought back to him it gives us the understanding of life in Israel after the conquest of Cana which Joshua led before the establishment of the first king in Israel that ushered in the age of the monarchy the last five chapters of judges give us a snapshot of what life was like during this era we don't know how long that era was. It's somewhere between 200 and 400 years. and It ended somewhere around 1050 B.C. with the establishment of Saul as the first king. But in those last five chapters, two episodes are highlighted that show us how sad life was. Tragic. How immoral life was during that era. During these years, after... Moses led the people out of slavery in Egypt, and Joshua led them on the great conquest of the land of Cana. Israel was ruled by a series of judges. But behind each one of these 13 judges, there stands one true judge who is God himself. The 13 judges that he raised up were given by God to his people periodically in order to rescue them from oppression from surrounding nations. The word judge can be somewhat misleading to us today as we look into this seventh book of the Old Testament. It's not a word that refers primarily, as we use it in modern language, to an expert in the law, to one who holds court in a courtroom, making decisions between right and wrong. Rather, it is a word that speaks primarily to leadership. It refers to a person who understands what needs to be done and is willing to engage whatever is necessary in order to get it done. In times of desperation, when his people were at their wit's end, God raised up leaders to save them. These leaders, however, no matter how diligent they were, no matter how useful they were, were, could not ultimately do what Israel ultimately needed to have done. Rather, as we will see, each one of those judges was flawed. And the peace that they won for their people during their lifetimes were temporary times of peace. What we find then in the book of Judges is that with the recurring cycles of the people falling into need, crying out to God, God raising up a judge to rescue them, is that with each cycle there comes an ending 
with the awareness of surely there's more. We need more. And the whole book of Judges ends with this understanding that the people of God still are in need of a Savior. The book of Judges points to the inadequacy of all human saviors, no matter how good they are. And leaves us longing for a Savior who will come and provide what only God Himself can provide. It points us to, it makes us hungry for the Savior, Jesus Christ. What I want to do this morning is introduce the book by pointing out three ways that it teaches us that God really is the true judge. And he's the true judge who wholeheartedly works to save his people. God never is knocked off course from his eternal purpose to save his people from their sin. The first lesson then that we can see in the book of Judges is this. God blesses his people and his people in turn forget him. We don't handle blessings very well. God's kind to us and what do we do? So often we turn his kindness into occasions to run away from him. The very first verse of this book, Judges 1.1, gives to us the historical context for the whole book when it says, after the death of Joshua. It points us back to the era just before this time of Judges. Joshua was the commander who led the Israelites into war against the nation of Cana, the nation God promised to give to their forefather Abraham and all of his offspring. When God chose Abraham, made him the founder of the Israelite people, he said that Abraham's descendants would one day have a land of their own. He raised up Moses to deliver those descendants of Abraham out of slavery from Egypt and then to lead them for 40 years into the wilderness. When Moses died, God anointed Joshua to be the commander who would take them into that land he promised them and lead them to possess it. When God made these promises to his people, he was saying, I will be your God. But he was also calling them to be his people, to live for him. And so before he died, before the people went across the river into the land of promise, Moses spent a lot of time in the book of Deuteronomy teaching them, warning them, reminding them of that which God called them to be and do. For example, in Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 1 through 6, this is what Moses said. When the Lord your God brings you into the land that you're entering to take possession of it and clears away many nations before you, the Hittites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, seven nations more numerous and mightier than you, and when the Lord your God gives them over to you and you defeat them, then you must devote them to complete destruction. You must make no covenant with them and show no mercy to them. You shall not intermarry with them, giving your daughters to their sons or taking their daughters for your sons, for they would turn away your sons from following me to serve other gods. Then the anger of the Lord your God would be kindled against you and he would destroy you quickly. But thus shall you deal with them. You shall break down their altars and dash in pieces their pillars and chop down their ashram and burn their carved images with fire. And then in verse 6 of this passage, Moses tells them why they have got to be so thorough in dispossessing the land of its people. For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. Joshua was chosen to be the commander who would lead the people to fulfill this promise that God had given to them to get a land for themselves. And the book just before Judges, the sixth book of the Old Testament that bears Joshua's name, tells the story of that conquest. Near the end of Joshua's life, after they have begun to take the land, they've begun to settle the land, having driven out many of the people from the land, Joshua reiterates God's instructions to his people. In Joshua 23, verse 6 and following, this is what he said. Therefore, to the people of Israel, be very strong to keep and to do all that is written in the book of the law of Moses, 
turning aside from it neither to the right hand nor to the left, that you may not mix with those nations remaining among you or make mention of the names of their gods or swear by them or serve them or bow down to them. But you shall cling to the Lord your God just as you have done to this day. For the Lord has driven out before you great and strong nations. As for you, no man has been able to stand before you to this day. One man of you puts to flight a thousand, since it is the Lord your God who fights for you, just as he promised. Be very careful, therefore, to love the Lord your God. For if you turn back and cling to the remnant of these nations remaining among you and make marriages with them, so that you associate with them and they with you, know for certain that the Lord your God will no longer drive out these nations before you, but they shall be a snare and a trap for you, a whip on your sides and thorns in your eyes until you perish from off this good ground that the Lord your God has given you. God himself pledged to be wholeheartedly for his people to provide them new life and a land that he promised to them and he commanded them in return to live wholeheartedly for him by not compromising with the pagan ways of the idolatrous people they were to drive out as we will see in our study of the book of judges though the israelites did indeed inhabit the land they did not completely dispossess it of all the pagan nations as God strictly commanded them to do. And their failure to obey the Lord completely resulted in recurring pains and hardships in their lives for hundreds of years. God was so kind to them. He was so generous to them. He delivered them from slavery. He gave them victory after victory to inhabit this promised land under the leadership of Joshua. Then after Joshua and his generation died out, the people he blessed forgot him. They began to ignore him. Look at chapter 2, beginning in verse 7. The author writes, And the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua, and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great work that the Lord had done for Israel. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110 years. And they buried him within the boundaries of his inheritance at timnath Heres, in the hill country of Ephraim, north of the mountain of Gaash. And all that generation also were gathered to their fathers. And there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord or the work that he had done for Israel. And the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals. Look again at verse 11. Do you see this summary statement of the people after the generation of Joshua? They did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. That's an apt summary of what happens throughout the years between the time of Joshua and the time of the monarchy in Israel. In fact, this very phrase is found five more times in the book of Judges to describe the spiritual state of the people. Think about this first generation there in the land of Canaan, these Israelites, the first generation of Israelites. Their grandparents had been slaves in Egypt. God had delivered them miraculously and given them freedom. Their parents had lived in tents during the 40 years of wandering in the Sinai desert, not ever having a permanent abode. And now here they are, perhaps with some of their parents, are being established as the first generation in the land of promise. And what is their epitaph? there arose another generation who did not know the Lord or the work that he had done for Israel. Consequently, their half-hearted devotion to the Lord who had been so good to them leads them to squander his blessings, to respond sinfully to his grace until finally 
the people of Israel can be characterized by self-centered, half-hearted, apathetic, insipid spirituality. Listen to the way the last verse of this book describes them. Chapter 21, verse 25. In those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. That's the great temptation that comes with God's blessings to His people. To presume upon those blessings. To forget the great cost at which those blessings have been provided. To lose our sense of wonder and awe that we have been blessed by this God. And then to begin to compromise with how we live. What we think. What we value. And begin to do what just seems right. Seems okay. Common sense. In our own eyes. Forgetting that we have a loyalty to the one who has so blessed us. I wonder how it is with you today. You know, every one of us here in this room, whether you know God personally or not. It is true of every one of us in this room to say, God has been good to me. God has been good to every one of us. You might not trust God. You might not believe in God. You might not be depending upon His grace in Jesus Christ, but it is still true. God has been good to you. He's given you life. He's given you whatever strength you have, whatever health you've enjoyed. He's given you the pleasures that you have had the benefit to experience in relationships and accomplishments. He's created you in His own image. He's given you the ability for significance, whether it's in the fields of art, or sports, or education, or labor, or business, or relationships, or family, or any other sphere. Anything that you've accomplished, anything you've come to enjoy, has come to you by the kind hand of God. How have you responded to the blessings of God in your life? Are you wholly devoted to Him? Do you live in response to these blessings with a conscious awareness that all you are, all you have is because of God's kindness to you? Or with honesty demand that you say, no, I'm more like these half-hearted Israelites in the land of Cana. I'm not wholly devoted to Him. My friend, God calls you to love Him with your whole heart, soul, mind and strength he calls you to recognize that he's the one who's given you all that you have he calls you to love and serve him first in your life to honor him in all of your thoughts to trust him and his provision of salvation that he makes for people like you he calls you to respond to him by trusting jesus christ his son as your lord the goodness of god is designed by God to lead you to turn away from all of the things that you've looked to to make your life work and to look to the one who's the source of your life and every blessing in your life. Do you look to God that way? Do you relate to Jesus Christ that way? Can you honestly say, Christ, Christ is my life. You trust the Lord you will experience the salvation that God provides for all who bow to Jesus as Lord. Church, there are great lessons in this for us as well. God has been amazingly, amazingly good to this congregation. Whether you've been a part of grace for weeks or years, your testimony has to be, God has been good to us. How are we going to respond to His goodness? How do we respond to His goodness? Have we slipped into a way of thinking that, well, of course God has blessed us because we have? If so, then today is the day to expose that, to repent of that, and to acknowledge 
God has blessed us because He is a God full of blessing and kindness and grace. And all that we are, all that we have, is because God has showered us with love and mercy and grace. And we should respond to that with a zeal and determination, a a wholehearted desire to live in accordance with His revealed will. Not so that He will bless us. Not so that He will be good to us. Not so that we will somehow earn His favor. But because He has been so good to us. Favored us so much. Been so full of mercy and grace to us that we want to live in ways that honor Him. So the first lesson that I want us to see in the book of Judges is that God blesses His people and His people turn away from Him in the face of those incredible blessings. But secondly, the book of Judges teaches us that God disciplines His people and they return to Him. He disciplines His people so that we will return to Him. God disciplines these Israelites in His loving anger. Once the Israelites forget God, they begin to drift into patterns of disobedience to His commandments. They disregard His will and become enticed into living the way that their pagan neighbors lived. They begin to think like these unbelieving neighbors. They begin to value like these unbelieving neighbors. And they begin to worship the idols of these pagan neighbors. Such disobedience provokes God to anger. He gets angry. Not at the expense of His love, but precisely because He does love. Anger is not always contrary to love. Sometimes the only way that true love can express itself appropriately is anger. Look at chapter 2, start again at verse 11, and see how God's love toward His people is manifested in His anger. That verse 11 says again, And the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals, And they abandoned the Lord, the God of their fathers, who had brought them out of the land of Egypt. They went after other gods from among the gods of the peoples who were around them and bowed down to them. And they provoked the Lord to anger. They abandoned the Lord and served the Baals and the Ashtoreth. So the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel and he gave them over to the plunderers who plundered them and he sold them into the hand of their surrounding enemies so that they could no longer withstand their enemies. Whenever they marched out, the hand of the Lord was against them for harm, as the Lord had warned, and as the Lord had sworn to them. And they were in terrible distress. Today, our understanding of love has become so distorted that when we read passages like this, where God treats His people severely, it sounds to us abusive and brutal. Because today, it's very common to speak of love in terms of permissiveness. Why, if you love me, you'll let me. If you love me, you wouldn't counter me. If you love me, you wouldn't try to stop me. You wouldn't cross me. If you love me, surely you wouldn't do anything to hurt me. That's why those of us who take the Bible seriously often find ourselves labeled as unloving and even hateful, because we dare to stand up and say what God says is right, wrong, good, and bad, true, and false. If you don't believe this, then at your next office party, or your next community gathering, next time you're with friends in the student center hanging out, and there's a pause in the conversation, I encourage you just to say this, you know, Marriage can only be between one man and one woman in an exclusive relationship. And see how that view is judged. And see how someone who would propose that view is regarded. Why, you're unloving, even bigoted, so says a growing number of people in our day. Why? Why do we get this response? Because 
people today have forgotten the God who is love and who has the right to say what love truly is. Consequently, popular notions of love have little, if anything, to do with God's definition of love. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 12 says this, The Lord disciplines those whom He loves, just as a father disciplines the son he delights in. God's discipline is an expression of His love. The book of Hebrews, the 12th chapter, elaborates this idea. It's worth considering if you're a child of God you need to take seriously what is said in Hebrews 12 5 through 11 let me read it to you the author there says to believers and have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons my son do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord nor be weary when reproved by him for the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives it is for discipline that you have to endure God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you're left without discipline, in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we've had earthly fathers who disciplined us and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the father's spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as seemed best to them. But he disciplines us for our good that we may share his holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. But later, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Parents, if you don't understand love in this way, you will never train your children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. You'll never do it. Because to correct them, to discipline them, will feel like you're being unloving and you will freeze and not give them what they need. You know, in fact, the Bible says the exact opposite is what's true. It's not exercising discipline of your children that is unloving. It's failure to discipline your children that is unloving. Proverbs 13, 24 says this, Whoever spares the rod hates his son, but he who loves him is diligent to discipline him. You and I may be guilty of being unloving parents who fail to discipline our children as we ought, but God is never guilty of being unloving toward His people. He will always in love, discipline us for our sins in order that He might restore us to proper fellowship with Him. This is why we see in the book of Judges time and time again how He delivered His people into the hands of their enemies. He did it because of their sin. But when He did it, such loving discipline had its intended, its intended effects. They would cry out to him in humility and brokenness. Look at verse 18 of chapter 2. This explains how it works in a summary way. Whenever the Lord raised up judges for them, the Lord was with the judge, and he saved them from the hand of their enemies all the days of the judge. For the Lord was moved to pity by their groaning because of those who afflicted and oppressed them. This is always the intended effect of God's discipline. It's not to destroy his people. It's to call His people back. It's to bring His people low over their sin that they might groan over it, that they might confess it, turn away from it, and return to Him. Humility and repentance is always the aim of God's discipline. Brothers and sisters, we need to be careful not to automatically attribute every trial, every difficulty as God's discipline for some specific sin in our lives. It may be, but it may not be. But we ought to be wise in taking advantage of every trial, every difficulty as an occasion to stop and examine ourselves and ask the Lord to show us if there's any wicked way in us and where sin is discovered, to repent of it, to, to lay it aside, to acknowledge, oh God, this is what we have been, this is what we renounce, and we no longer want to live this way. 
One day early in the American Revolution, Benjamin Rush was sitting with John Adams in Congress while it was in session. And Rush leaned over and in a whisper asked John Adams if he thought America would succeed in this struggle. Adams responded by saying, yes, if we fear God and repent of our sins. Our nation has never needed such counsel more than today. Our churches in this land have never needed such wisdom more than today. Brothers and sisters, pray. Pray that we will be properly humbled in the presence of every trial and affliction. Pray that for our nation in what we are enduring almost daily. New evidences of trial and brokenness. Pray God will humble us. and Grant to us repentance. Pray it for this church. Pray that God will make us a people sensitive to Him that in the midst of trial, in the midst of struggle and difficulty, that we will respond not in arrogance, not in indifference, but in brokenness and humility. Looking to Him, examining ourselves. Pray it for yourself. Are you going through trials? Are you in the midst of difficulties? Take advantage of the opportunity to ask the Lord, God, search me. Know me. See if there's any unclean way in me. And in that examination, be willing to turn from any sin that is discovered. Christianity is unlike all the religions of the world because it does not affirm people in their sin. Christianity calls sinners to turn away from sin and find forgiveness and peace and reconciliation with the God against whom they've sinned. And so if you are here this morning and you're wondering if if this church has anything to offer you, if you're looking simply for affirmation the way you are, this isn't the church for you. If rather you are looking for Knowledge of God, reconciliation with God, and a willingness to be instructed in how God comes to give life to people like you and me. We've got good news for you. It's not that, hey, you're okay the way you are. It is this. God sent His Son, Jesus Christ, into the world for sinners so that all who turn from sin and trust Him can receive forgiveness and be reconciled to Him and have life everlasting, not to be affirmed in your sin but to be guaranteed that your sin can be separated from you as far as the east is from the west on the basis of what Jesus has done. That's our message. That's the hope. That's the good news for people who are honest enough to admit we have fallen short of what God requires. Once you come to Jesus Christ through repentance and faith, The life of discipleship and following Him is marked in the same way. It's a life of repentance and faith. You don't just repent and trust Christ to get into relationship with Him. You continue to live in repentance and faith. Day by day, acknowledging your sin, turning from it. Day by day, acknowledging Christ as your righteousness, as your Savior. Turning to Him so that Christians are not only believers, we are repenters. Repentance becomes a part of our understanding of what it means to live in humility before our great Savior as we walk with God in this world. So God blesses His people and they forget Him. God disciplines His people and they return to Him. The final lesson that I want us to see this morning in this overview of Judges is that God rescues His people and they enjoy peace. Once the Israelites cry out to God in their humility and brokenness, the Lord raises up a deliverer. He raises up a judge to save them from their enemies. And as long as that judge is alive, the people continue to live in peace. 
But once the judge dies, the people revert back to their ways of disobedience. And the cycle begins again. The peace that the people of God enjoyed in this era of judges was temporary. Under Jephthah in chapters 10 and 11, that judge saw peace for only six years. We see under Ehud in chapter 3, it lasted for 80 years. But whether six years or 80 years or periods in between those two extremes, it was always temporary. It never lasted forever. Furthermore, in each case, the leader, the judge who God raised up to save his people, was flawed. Flawed, deeply flawed in some cases. You have among the judges a left-handed assassin. You have the son of a prostitute. You have a sex addict who was a Nazarite. And whether they were highly renowned and highly regarded or basically unknown, they were flawed. As you read through the book of Judges, you'll come across names that may be familiar to you if you spent much time in Sunday school. You'll hear of Deborah, you'll hear of Gideon and Samson, but you'll also likely hear of names that are not so familiar to you, like Tola and Jair and Shamgar and Ibzan and Ebon and Abdon. But whether prominent or obscure, all of the judges serve the purposes of the true judge, God himself. And he raised them up in order to demonstrate his wholehearted determination to save his people from their sin. God will always keep his word. He will never let his promises fall to the ground unfulfilled. He will save all his people from all their enemies and give them peace. But the book of Judges ends with the Israelites still in need of yet another savior. Even the best of human judges wasn't enough. Later, when God gave them kings, even the best and greatest king couldn't give them permanent deliverance and peace. In fact, the whole Old Testament ends the way the book of Judges ends. Looking forward to another Savior, to another Rescuer, to another Leader. To someone who will come and do what we ultimately must have done that no mere mortal can supply. The book of Judges closes pointing us to the need of God's eternal Son, Jesus Christ, who comes in fulfillment of these promises to save His people completely. Jesus alone is able to save to the uttermost those who come to faith in Him. The peace that He gives is eternal and unshakable. And as such, Jesus and Jesus alone is worthy of our wholehearted devotion. He calls us to trust Him, to follow Him in a world that is filled with many temptations and obstacles that would compete with our loyalty to Him as Lord and Lord alone. Brothers and sisters, pray that God would stir us up through the study of His Word to be amazed in fresh way at the wholehearted devotion that God has toward His people. And He would stir us up to respond in renouncing half-hearted devotion to such a great Savior, but rather make us a people who are holy, freely, joyfully, offering up our lives to the only one who can ever save us completely from all our sins. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you have spoken to us in the book of Judges with clear illustrations, examples of the way we tend to live in this world. Responding poorly to your blessings. Finding grace to help us in our time of need. And yet, discovering that all of the human saviors that we turn to 
will always let us down. Help us, O oh God, to lay hold of that one who alone can rescue us forever. Help us to see in Jesus Christ all our hearts long for, all that we need, and to find in him life everlasting. Grant to us that we pray in his name. Amen.